This is the inspiring rise of Patagonia and how its founder, Yvon Schwinnard, once lived on just 50 cents per day, scraping stuff from dumpsters to get by, all while establishing his company. But despite this challenging start, he went on to create one of the most successful outdoor apparel brands in the world. It all started when Yvon developed a passion for extreme sports like rock climbing and surfing, seemingly simple hobbies that would later become central to his life and work. Before founding Patagonia, Yvon worked as a black Smith, creating custom equipment for his climbing and mountaineering pursuits. In the early days of his climbing and blacksmithing career, Yvonne lived a very frugal lifestyle, often resorting to dumpster diving and living on a very tight budget of 50 cents per day. How he was able to live like that, I have absolutely no idea, but he was committed to living a simple life that allowed him to pursue his passion for climbing and outdoor adventures, which often meant making do with very little money. Yvonne's rags to riches story began when he started selling his gear to other climbers. This eventually led to the formation of Twinard Equipment in 1965, which produced high-quality climbing gear such as carabiners, ice axes, and pitons, which are metal spikes driven into the rock to provide a secure anchor for climbers. Well, that's what I love about English. French. Moving on, known for being an existential dirtbag, Yvonne was also famously living out of his car while traveling to climbing destinations while selling his climbing gear directly out of his trunk, often at a lower price than his competitors. Think a dollar and fifty for each set of pitons, and that's already a premium price in itself. Yvonne believed that by keeping his overhead costs low, he could offer high quality gear at a more affordable price. As his business grew, Yvonne's company began selling other climbing gear such as carabiners and ropes, but continued to keep their products simple. However, as Yvonne expanded his business, he came across a key realization that eventually led to the advocacy that Patagonia would be known for. Yvonne discovered that traditional pitons were made of hardened steel and caused significant damage to the rock and mountain environment, which awoke his pursuit for protecting the earth. So, one of the key innovations he introduced was a new type of piton which he developed from a softer steel alloy. Can't take that for granted. This was less damaging to the rock and could be easily removed after use, but of course, you don't want to remove yourself as well from the rock while, while you're removing the piton. Yvonne and his friends continued their mountain climbing hobbies while also running the business. In 1970, Yvonne would come across the breakthrough that led to Patagonia's creation. That year, on a mountain climbing trip in Scotland, Yvonne wore a rugby shirt while climbing instead of the traditional climbing uniform that can be bought at thrift stores. He had this idea that it would suit him better since rugby shirts are made to withstand the physical demands of, well, rugby. And as it turned out, the idea was genius hiding in plain sight. The rugby shirt was able to withstand the climb, plus it had a collar that protected Yvonne's neck from the slings that came with his mountain climbing equipment. When he returned to the States, Yvonne continued wearing the rugby shirt while mountain climbing with his friends, who got curious and asked where they could get one. And I guess you could see where this is going. The light bulb instantly turned on in Yvonne's head, and he shifted his focus towards establishing a clothing division for his company. By 1972, Yvonne and his team were selling rugby shirts they bought from England, raincoats and bivy sacks from Scotland, and wool gloves and mittens from Austria. The clothing division grew so fast that Yvonne decided it needed a name of its own, and voila, in 1973, Patagonia was born. But of course, knowing Yvonne, the company had to be sustainable and environmentally responsible. So, Patagonia aimed to produce high-quality, durable outdoor clothing and gear while causing the least amount of damage to the environment. From the beginning, the company has focused on using environmentally friendly materials instead of the usual hazardous materials that their competitors used. Yvonne and his wife Melinda began producing clothing for outdoor enthusiasts such as durable jackets, pants, and shorts. Their clothes were made from high-quality materials such as organic cotton and recycled polyester and were designed for outdoor activities. Yvonne has always been known for his unconventional approach to outdoor gear and clothing, and for one of Patagonia's most well-known products, he returned turned to the one that started it all, the rugby shirt. He was struck by the idea of the shirt being made to withstand strong forces and thought the design could be used for other outdoor activities as well. He began experimenting with different materials, eventually creating his version of the rugby jersey specifically tailored for outdoor enthusiasts. The result was the pile jacket, which
which was made from a thick, fuzzy material that was warm, snug, and strong enough to withstand the demands of extreme sports. It became one of Patagonia's signature products and helped establish its reputation for high-quality, innovative outdoor clothing. While Yvonne's climbing gear helped the company achieve its early success, it was its entry into the outdoor apparel market that really propelled the company to new heights. Patagonia quickly became popular among outdoor enthusiasts and over time, the company expanded into new product categories including surfwear, backpacks, and outdoor accessories. Eventually, Yvonne's company grew into a $3 billion business. There's not a lot of clothing manufacturers who can proudly say that they are billion dollar companies, but Patagonia, which was built by self-confessed reluctant businessmen, is one of them. It's quite an impressive feat for this 50-year-old company, but you might be shocked to know that Yvonne doesn't really care. In fact, it was never his goal to become rich in the first place. He always saw Patagonia as a way for him to promote environmental stability. This, not money, has always been the key factor that drove Patagonia through the years. I mean, how many businesses can you think of whose founder openly stated they are not driven by money? Perhaps Apple, they don't like money, do they? Or Microsoft, Amazon, no. No, I can't say they don't. Since its founding, Patagonia has grown from a small clothing company focused on people who love the great outdoors to a well-known global brand with a strong reputation for sustainability and social responsibility. The company has always prioritized using sustainable materials and production methods and has been vocal in advocating for environmental issues and social causes such as protecting public lands and has taken steps to ensure that its products are produced the right way. This has helped Patagonia appeal to consumers who are looking for brands that align with their values and beliefs. The earliest example of Patagonia's environmental activism was in 1985 when the company launched a campaign called The Next 100 Years. This campaign aimed to encourage people to think about the long-term consequences of their actions on the environment and to promote a more sustainable lifestyle. In the 1990s, Patagonia introduced several environmentally friendly products such as fleece made from recycled plastic bottles. The company also started making adjustments to its supply chain and production processes to reduce its environment environmental impact. In 2002, Yvonne founded 1% for the Planet, which encourages businesses to donate 1% of their profits to environmental causes. Patagonia was one of the first companies to join the organization, and it has donated millions of dollars to environmental causes over the years. As Patagonia grows, it continues to innovate and push the boundaries of sustainable and ethical business practices. They continue to develop new materials, such as regenerative organic cotton, and have launched programs to reduce waste and encourage the repair and reuse of its products. Patagonia's War and Wear program, for example, aims to keep its products in action for longer by recycling garments beyond repair and creating a market for second-hand Patagonia clothing and gear on its online store. Perhaps one of Patagonia's most remarkable projects is its Don't Buy This Jacket campaign. It was launched in 2011 and focused on Patagonia's best-selling R2 jacket, which was made using recycled polyester and required a significant amount of energy and resources to produce. The company placed a full-page advertisement in the New York Times showing a picture of the R2 jacket along with the headline, Don't Buy This Jacket. The ad went on to explain the environmental impact of the jacket and urged consumers to think twice before making a purchase. Yvonne himself has written books on sustainability, spoken out on the importance of protecting public lands, and even refused to sell products to companies he believed were environmentally harmful. And as if those weren't already enough, in 2019, Yvonne announced that he was donating most of his wealth, including his shares in Patagonia, to environmental causes. He transferred $10 million to a fund that will help protect public lands, and he plans to give away the majority of his estimated $1 billion fortune to environmental organizations. I mean, seriously, how cool is this guy? Many aim to become a billion dollar company but fail. And then there's Patagonia who only wanted to promote saving the planet through their products but ended up being one of the world's biggest clothing brands. The story of Patagonia and Yvonne Schwinnard is a rags to riches tale of how strong values can lead to unimaginable success. For those who think that it's impossible to build a legacy off of your passion, Patagonia is living proof that it can definitely be done.